Good afternoon. Welcome to the New York edition of the series of state webinars exploring the findings from American Farmland Trust's recently released Farms Under Threat, the State of the States report. Before we get started, let me run through a couple of logistical issues. Everyone has been muted, so no need to do that yourself. If you would like to ask a question or make a comment, look at the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. You'll see a question section in that control panel. Um, you can type in it by hitting the little box that decouples it from, um, from the dashboard, and that will allow you to um, type in a question there. We will um, stop for questions a couple of times along in the presentation. We are also recording, I'm sorry, I'm having very bad feedback. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that little hiccup. Let me introduce myself. Um, I'm Chris Coffin. I am AFT's Senior Policy Advisor. I also direct our newly launched National Agricultural Land Network, which we'll talk about later. Co-hosting with me are Erica Goodman and Samantha Levy. Erica is our New York Regional Director. Samantha is our New York Policy Manager. Both are probably well known to most of you on this webinar. Before I turn it over to Erica and Sam, though, let me introduce American Farmland Trust for those of you who may, not, who may not be familiar with us. American Farmland Trust is a national nonprofit membership organization founded in 1980. Some know us best by our No Farms, No Food bumper sticker. We are an agricultural land trust, but understand that it's not farmland without farmers. So we focus on the viability side of agriculture as well. We are deeply involved in federal and state policy development and advocacy, and we are increasingly involved in programming around land access and farm transfer and succession, and the vital roles farmers and farmland already play and can play in the future in mitigating climate change. Our New York office is one of our oldest. It's been around for almost 30 years. So Erica, let me now turn it over to you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, the work of this report was completed in partnership with NRCS and Conservation Science Partners. We're grateful for their support and collaboration, uh, but it extends beyond that. We're really thankful for the numerous partners that are joining us here today. We have New York State Department of Ag and Markets, Department of State, NYSERDA, Adirondack Park Agency, and New York State Legislative Staff, as well as numerous land trusts, extension districts, and others who've joined us today. So grateful for all of your time. So look through some of this research and we also look forward to further engaging you um, around this research and this report in the months and years ahead. We're joined today by special guest New York State Commissioner of Agriculture Richard Ball. Commissioner Ball is the owner and operator of Schoharie Valley Farms in Schoharie, New York. It's a mixed vegetable, fruits, and greenhouse operation. He served as New York State Commissioner of Agriculture since 2014 where he has championed programs to keep New York's farmland in farms and future generations of farmers on the land. Commissioner Ball, thank you for all that you've done uh, and really being a great supporter of farmers in New York during this challenging time. And we appreciate you spending some of that time today to talk to us about farms under threat and what that means for New York. We appreciate the work that your administration has done to protect farmland in the state. And um, in fact, as you'll see in this report, New York State ranked high for our agricultural district programs as well as set the bar for publicly funded FarmLink programs with FarmLink for New Generation New York for providing most robust support across the nation to help provide a new generation uh, access to land in the state. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Commissioner Ball, to share your perspective of what we're seeing about um, FarmLink loss and farming across the state more generally. Well, thank you so much, Erica, and thank you, Chris, and thank you also, Sam. 
and I appreciate everyone being a, a part of this webinar today and uh, for taking the time to uh, pay attention to this important subject. Um, again, a special thanks to American Farmland Trust for, frankly, your your vigilance on this subject and for uh, a lot of years of homework, a lot of years of research uh, with regards to one of our uh, obviously most valuable resources, and that's our farmland. Um, I hope uh, everyone uh, listening and participating is is safe and healthy. Uh, we're we're in a very unusual, unprecedented time right now with COVID-19, uh, the disruptions to our work life, our personal lives, and our social lives has been uh, pretty dramatic. And uh, of course, we've got some, some tenuous situations going on around the country. But having said all that, the work uh, at the Department of Agriculture and our, our interest certainly in this subject are, are ongoing. I, uh, I just have to uh, take a minute and think back to um, 2013 in the fall when when I did get a call from the governor asking me to take on this this role as commissioner for agriculture in New York and you know the conversation we had revolved around connecting the dots between a fantastic agricultural community that we have in New York state and uh you know a largely um diverse and and magnificent mar marketplace uh, that we have in uh, downstate New York and in our urban areas. Uh, and I was excited about the opportunity to try to do that. And I see this this effort around farmland preservation as very much a connecting the dots exercise. I have uh, been a farmer um, since I was 18 years old and made my living in agriculture. And I've looked to the east, I've looked to the south, and I've seen areas where they used to make a living in agriculture, where people talked about that. And close to home, uh, we can see uh, farmland that we've lost uh, due to sprawl from urban areas and uh, creek encroaching on our rural agricultural areas. New York State uh, ranks in the top 10 of over 30 different commodities. We have very high quality land here. We have some of the best growers in the country. We have access to water. We have the best land grant system for ag education anywhere in the nation. And again, we have that biggest, most diverse marketplace anywhere in the world right at our doorstep. So we want to uh, clearly make sure that agriculture remains a viable way for the next generations to make a living in New York State. We've been pretty committed to that. We uh, have worked very closely with American Farmland Trust and so many of you to, to further that with our beginner farmer work groups and uh, the various programs that we have in farmland preservation. I think. Uh, the governor has shown a, an ongoing commitment in funding uh, year after year to do that. It's a regular part of our budget. Uh, we've had the biggest um, environmental protection fund in the history of New York, uh, and it's certainly dedicated uh, some resources to doing innovative programs around farmland preservation. We're committed to continuing that. Uh, we're committed to meeting with our stakeholders every year to uh, make sure the program's working for everyone and looking at ways to fine tune it. And again, uh, our goal and your goal, I know, is to make sure that agriculture remains viable here in New York. And I'm very encouraged by uh, our, uh, our opportunities. Um, and I think that uh, the world is beginning to take note of what we're doing here. So I'm gonna stop there and just say thanks so much again for this opportunity. Appreciate uh, your homework for Farms Under Threat and the state of the states here and look forward to uh, hearing the rest of this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Ball. Appreciate you taking the time today and for all the work that the governor and the Department of Ag and Markets has really done to, to fund and support farmland protection, as well as farming, farmers and farmland across the state in many ways. And we look forward to collaborating with you on next steps that we'll be drawing from this research. So thanks again. And for that, I'll turn it over to Chris. Great. Thank you, Erica. And thank you again for joining us, Commissioner Ball, and thank you for your great leadership in New York. Um, so let's switch to uh, um, farms under threat. Today we're talking about the state of the states, which is the second in our farms under threat research initiative. Um, state of the states paints a striking picture of the threats facing working farms and ranches in every state and documents the steps 
every state has taken to protect their agricultural land base from development. Um, the state of the states uses advanced spatial mapping to identify the threats to agricultural land. It also includes an in-depth analysis of state policy responses. And with these um, two things, we are hoping to raise public awareness, to inform state and federal policy, and to encourage more direct and permanent agricultural land protection. So with that, I am going to now take us into the interactive website that we have created um, with Farms Under Threat. Um, and we wanted to give folks a tour, not just as a way to discuss the findings, but also to show the tools that are in this um, website so that you can um, use them yourselves. So, before I go to New York, I just want to show that over here is reports and data. When, you, when we start looking in on a lot of the spatial work, you'll see that there are lots of, I'm sorry, that's not exactly what I wanted to do. Um, you will see that there are lots of reports and data that explain a lot of the spatial analysis that we've done. Um, so that's a very useful thing to look at. So you go down to the drop down menu and you find New York, and let's click on New York. And we're gonna start here with um, the land use, um, land cover and use slide. What we did, this was the first, um, this, we used multiple national data sets to develop the best available spatial inventory of agricultural land use in the US. Um, one of the neat features about this is that we have spatially identified woodland associated with farms and mapped that as you can see. And with this map, you can see this land use and cover that you can see the areas that we have mapped as low density residential development and high density development um, when you zoom in, which I am not going to do quite yet. So let's look at a second feature, which is productivity, versatility, and resiliency. This is a map that shows the range, and let me go down just a little bit more, the range of the index for New York. I'll go back up. Um, the PVR values are a first ever assessment of agricultural land quality that is focused on suitability for long-term intensive crop production um, and focused really on the productivity, versatility, and resiliency of the land. Um, the higher the PVR value, the higher the suitability for intensive crop production, especially for food crops such as fruits, nuts, vegetables, and staple grains. With this information about um, uh, on the, I'm sorry, I'm having troubles with moment with my cursor. With this, um, this PBR values, we have looked then at the highest of the PBR values nationally, and this is a map that shows you nationally significant land. Um, this is the land that we consider the most suitable for um, um, for intent, long term intensive crop production. Um, and you will see that in New York that there is a significant amount of land that we consider to be nationally significant. That's 54% of the agricultural land base. So let me go to the last of the slides um, here in terms of um, the spatial data. And this is the conversion of land. And you will see that um, we talk here that over here on the left, the key metrics, that there were over a period of time from 20, 2001 to 2016, the 253,500 acres of New York's agricultural land were converted. And we characterized them and we looked at conversion in two different ways. First, we looked at urban and highly developed land use, or UHD. This includes the traditional culprits in farmland conversion. 
expanding residential, commercial, and industrial areas, um, which are mostly found in cities and towns. But this category also includes rural, industrial, and energy production sites, so including oil and gas well pads and solar panel installations. The second um, type is called low density residential development. And as you can see, this is the predominant type of conversion threat that New York is facing. 197,000 acres or 78% of the land converted was to this sort of insidious low density residential development. It's the, it's the type of development that we don't often see, um, which but it fragments the agricultural land base. Um, this is the first effort of its kind to quantify the extent of large lot housing on the agricultural land base. And LDR areas range from lower density subdivisions to rural areas where more and more individual housing lots are being um, uh, cited. So the one point to make clear is where you see over here that LDR paves the way for further development. We looked at agricultural land from 2001 um, that was considered to be low density residential development. That, was, that land was 10 times more likely to be converted to urban and high density development by 2016 so that we know that low density residential development is often a pathway for further development. Um, so let me stop there um, because I think um, this will be a good time for Erica, you to step in and um, offer a little bit of comment about what we're seeing here on the conversion. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, if you could just zoom in a little bit to Erie and Niagara County and the western part of the state. So as Chris does that, you'll notice that each part of the state has high quality farmland. That's with the, the green that we're seeing here and the dark green color. And it also has seen conversion in the different parts of the state where you see the red um, pop out here as well. So as we're looking at a just as example in Western New York, uh, just want to recognize that each part of the state kind of brings its own diverse and unique considerations when we're, we're looking at the results of the research, but um, wanted to, to target a little bit of what we're kind of seeing in this part of the state for an example. So we're looking right now at the conversion map and looking at Niagara and Erie County, which the gray is where, where Buffalo is, and you see this band of conversion around Buffalo, as well as other small pockets that surround it. It's also, as you'll see in, in this expanse of green, uh, where there's a lot of the, some of the best farmland in the state, but also in the country, um, that has current demands being pushed by the escalating need to feed local communities and provide climate benefits, while we're also seeing the, the demand of the land with, with some of this development pressure. Chris, could you switch over to the land cover and use map so we can look at the um, urban versus the lower density? Yep. Thank you. So as Chris mentioned, this research can kind of looked at uh, a, a different layer and something that we can, hadn't really explored to this degree before of low density residential. I think this is really significant in New York because of the high percentage of conversion that we've seen in this low density. And so in this map, the orange is color is low density residential. You can even see how that kind of has, has pockets that have gone beyond what we were looking at in, in the red spaces in the last map. So it's, you know, we're looking at some of the best farmland in the country. We're looking at increased need to feed communities and have climate benefits, but this land, uh, low density residential actually can fragment the landscape in ways that is often less visible. So it appears that there's maybe less of a threat, but um, and also there's less of an immediate response. And so as each of you kind of use and, and reference this resource, I think it's important to look at that low density as, as how it's fragmenting the land and impacting agricultural uh, sustainability in, in those regions of, of the state where you're working or if you're looking at it more broadly as well. Um, it you know, helps to highlight and looking at what you're thinking about with planning and protection along with other policies that Chris will be discussing and, and talking about here in the next few portions, but also to address trends that are perhaps newer to development, you know, in particular solar. We know solar is really important to meet our climate goals, but 
in a place like uh, Niagara, which is, is just north here of Erie County. There's a significant amount of really important and nationally significant farmland, but also large solar scale projects proposed. And so the information from this research, we're hopeful we'll be able to help communities in, in all sorts of planning, whether areas that they've been thinking about already, but some of those new demands on the land too, so that we're kind of mitigating the loss of development on um, that most important and nationally significant land. And uh, before we move on, I think we wanted to just do a little little dive in here in a, in a part of the state. I know that we also wanted to ask some questions of all of you. Um, what do you think are going to be some of the primary drivers of, of the different types of conversion that we're seeing here on the maps and have been revealed to the research? And what are those drivers? And so we actually have, have a poll uh, I believe that Chris is going to launch. And um, we'll have it up there if you'd like to, to vote and just comment on what you think will be the biggest drivers of loss agricultural land in the state over the next 20 years. All right, we're seeing some responses come in. Right. This is interesting. Well, thank you all for voting. That's helpful um, that, you know, the top, the top vote getter being more and poorly planned housing, commercial, industrial development um, followed um, by generational transfer. And um, we think both of these are, uh, th those would probably be my two vote getters as well in terms of um, continued threats. So let's think about that as we are um, walking into the policy scorecard about what New York is doing and what more New York might be able to do to address some of these drivers moving forward. So um, our intent here with the scorecard is to highlight effective elements of state policies that address what we see as the three main drivers of agricultural land conversion. And those drivers, those historical drivers, um, have been poorly planned development, um, weak agricultural viability or profitability in agriculture, and third, that the fact that land is most vulnerable when it transfers between generations. So um, while AFT has done um, has a lot of work around federal and state policy development and advocacy since our finding founding, this is our first um, attempt at doing a scorecard. So um, we hope that it is useful. The intent is to showcase ways that states are taking action. Um, and we did not include everything. For, first, for starters, we understand that there are many state policies um, that are focused on ag viability and strengthening business support and marketing opportunities for agriculture. They are not included in here. We are um, focused most particularly on those that relate to land in some way. And so you see that the, the, the policies and programs that we focused on fell into these six categories. Um, permanent farmland protection through the purchase of agricultural conservation easement programs or PDR programs, purchase of development rights. Um, we looked at land use planning and growth management and both where there are state, um, state land use planning, whether there's consistency between state and local uh, land use planning, whether there are state goals, whether there is support for planning at the community level. Um, we looked at property tax relief for agricultural land, understanding that having um, some amount of current use assessment um, or agricultural use assessment is very important for farmers. 
We looked at agricultural district programs, which are ones that tend to combine a number of things, thinking around planning and um, protections for farmers in districts and potentially some types of um, preferential tax treatment. Um, we then looked at farm link programs and state leasing programs as two types of programs that focus on that access to land for a next generation and some of the generational transfer challenges. So looking at that, let's go down to look at where New York, um, where New York falls in its policy scores. And you see that New York is um, uh, about median on the purchase of agricultural conservation easement and planning front. It is ahead of the curve on the property tax assessments and the agricultural district significantly um, better than the median fall short on the state leasing, but is at the top and is in fact considered the national um, best in class in terms of farm link. So let's take a minute to go in to look at some of these. Um, here you see that you can go into details on the selecting the policy or program. So let's go to the PACE programs. And here you can find all the individual scores. You will see New York down um, sandwiched in between California and Florida here. It does quite well in having good enabling authority for the purchase of agricultural conservation easements. Where it and it gets a good score, I think, because of its authorization of preemptive purchase rights as part of its program, where it does not fare as well as some of the leaders um, is the funding and the average um, percent of land protected. Um, so that's just, you know, continues to make the case for um, continued investments in the program. Um, let's go look for a minute then at um, land use planning. And here is a spot where New York, relative to many other states, does not do particularly well. It's in the lower half of states in terms of its policy response. Um, when you look here, I mean, what, what, where New York gets some points and where we think that New York has been doing good things is to be providing some support around farmland protection planning. But overall, you see that there's not support for comprehensive planning, um, that there's not any requirement for consistency with state goals, and that really there's not much in terms of state goal setting um, that encourages um, communities to do more. And so when we think about land use planning and we can come back to it later, it's sort of thinking what more can the state do from the sort of top-down approach to be incentivizing communities to do more and at, at the community level, what more can we be doing um, to be providing the right tools and getting them into the hands of folks at the community level. Um, let me lastly then just take, and I should say, if you look down at the bottom of how we scored it, this shows you all of the ways that um, the scores, what went in behind the scores, um, the number of points awarded for what type of activity. So when you want to dig in, that's a good way to do it. Um, let me look now just to go to farm link programs. And there you see New York is at the top of the list. And um, I just want to give a shout out to uh, everyone in New York who the State Department of Ag and Markets and all of the partners who've been involved with this very innovative program. So let me stop there and again, turn it back to uh, Erica and Samantha for any thoughts on um, the policy front.
Yeah, thanks, Chris. This is Samantha. I guess the only thing that I would add, and you know, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, is that um, these are these results are going to certainly inform our policy work going forward at AFT and in partnership with so many of you who are on the phone, whether you work for state government or um, are part of a coalition that um, that we manage in New York State. So I guess that's the only thing I would add at this point. Great. Okay, Erica, anything or otherwise I'll go out of I'll go out of here and back to the PowerPoint. Uh, good on my end. I've got a few questions we'll jump into in a moment, but uh, otherwise looks good, Chris. Okay. So let me, um, before we stop for questions, um, I'm putting up this um, map of permanently protected um, farmland. And we, you will notice once you dive into the spatial um, databases that we used that we did not, um, we were not able to map permanently protected agricultural land. There is a national conservation um, day, I don't even, I'm blanking on the name of it. Um, there is a national easement database. It does not focus specifically on agricultural land, which was our intent with this entire project. So we are building a um, protected agricultural land database nationally. These are the results that we have thus far. If you are a land trust and you are on this webinar and we have not been in touch with you um, about getting any data you have about permanently protected agricultural land, we apologize for that. But if you would put into the question box that you have some information to share with us, we will be in touch with you because we are trying to make this as robust a database as we can. So with that, um, why don't we stop for a moment um, and uh, answer some questions. Great, Chris. So a couple of questions have come in just to actually clarify a few of the definitions. So if, if you don't mind walking through again what PVR stands for and then also what nationally significant farmland means. Right, so PVR is productivity, versatility, and resiliency. So much of the productivity, and this was, a, this was an index that we put together in consultation with a national panel of experts. Um, it relies in part on soil um, capability, um, soil type, soil classes, but it goes beyond that because then what we did is that we also looked at climate type, we looked at um, the type of crops that have been grown on it. So the versatility of the ability of the, the land to grow a number of different types of crops and the length of how long it has been done to do that. You will see when I mentioned in the reports that there's a whole explanation about the PVR index, which goes into a lot more detail. And I would encourage people to go look at that but it's, it's based on soils, but it then expands. Um, for the most part, it tracks, you'll find that it tracks a sort of prime farmland and soil, I think, suitability classes one and two, if I have that terminology right. But it's, it's not, um, it is not a complete overlap. And we think that ours is a little more robust in looking at its slightly broader factors. So that nationally, um, significant land is land that is in about, it was a factor of 0.43 on the PVR index or 0.43 or above. It is a one third of the agricultural land in the country. We fit into that um, uh, definition. And so we came up with the name um, of nationally significant agricultural land. And the reason for doing that is that American Farmland Trust does believe that farmland should be protected, farmland and ranch land um, is of importance 
for many reasons and the many attributes, um, but we did want to make a distinction that there is some land that is more uh, important to intensive crop production than others and that states and the federal government should think more intently about trying to minimize development of that land in particular. Great, thanks, Chris. Uh, some uh, question too, or a couple of questions actually about how to access the data for GIS. So can the information be used with in-house GIS? Are there layers? that can be added, um, anything you can offer on that front of how, how those with GIS capabilities can dig into the data? Um, yes, we do. We are making the data available, and my apologies. Um, there is, if you go to the AFT website, farmland.org, and look at the farms under threat, I believe there's a link there to request the data. Um, you can also just type, if you are interested in the data, type your um, contact info in as a question, and we will be sure to send you the link. And I think what we can do is we can send the link to that data request um, back out when we send out the recording of the webinar. Great, thank you. We dove in a little bit to planning and we were looking at the New York policy scorecard and a question was posed about if there's any insight from where other states are doing well that we might learn from. And, and I know, Chris, that uh, putting you on the spot with this is you're digging into these conversations across the country um, and something we can certainly follow up on. But if you have any uh, input from, from what you've seen so far, uh, it'd be great to hear. Right. Well, that's a good question. Um, and we could spend hours on um, effective land use planning and planning around um, planning for agriculture as we like to talk about it. But um, I think that what we found when we did this that um, the most effective approaches were those where there was some amount of regulatory teeth involved. And you look at the examples of that and they are on the west coast with Oregon and Washington. Now some of that land use regulation has been in place for a long time. So it's um, it, thinking about what are approaches that can um, that can be put in place now. I think that as I was talking earlier, I think that we feel that having state goals, whether that is a state goal around both compact development and around farmland protection, and then some requirements and consistency at the local level of how you create, how you require some consistency of planning that um, comports with that state goal. And there are many different ways of doing it and there are many ways of approaching it. And it might be that you can do some additional planning through the already um, existing agricultural district structure that New York has. So it's a much longer conversation and we would welcome an opportunity to continue this conversation um, on the planning front, but where we have seen it around the country is where there is some required consistency between a state goal um, and um, what local planning and zoning looks like. Great, thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm gonna actually turn a question over to Samantha about solar and kind of the value of this resource in thinking about solar, potential solar projects in New York State. So, you know, questions both about the, what this map tells us when thinking about the, uh, where and potential effects of uh, solar in relation to the best farmland as we were just discussing in the definitions that Chris explained as well as you know if if there's any kind of proposed or proposed conversion including this map so Samantha would you like to, to take on those questions sure happy to thanks Erica um, obviously, this is, uh, it, for those of you that know me, something that I'm working uh, a lot on these days, particularly with the new large-scale renewable siting law that was just passed um, in, in the state budget. Um, 
so you know, I think that this this um, project, this report, and the spatial analysis uh, are certainly um, uh, like at the ready to inform um, those types of choices of where new renewable energy development um, really should take place in New York State. And, uh, you know, I think that the, the development that's reflected in the maps of um, urban highly developed areas and low density res residential developments don't currently include um, conversion due to um, something like a solar array. Um, you know, of course, solar is a, a type of energy generation that is more land intensive, blanketing the land. Something that John Piotti, AFT's president, often says is that farmers are the original um, solar energy developers, taking solar energy and developing it into food that we can all eat. Um, so that the um, considerations about the national value of this farmland, um, its its potential to sequester carbon, which is better than um, the other agricultural lands that we're seeing on these spatial maps. Um, I think that these are all things that need to go into the thinking um, for local governments, for state government, for developers, and for, you know, farmers are already thinking about this stuff, of course. Um, but as we look at um, the potential for new types of renewable energy development to meet really important state climate goals. Um, and just one other quick point to make on that, uh, you know, I've mentioned solar quite a lot and didn't really mention wind. Um, because with a smaller footprint, wind does tend to be more compatible with agricultural activities. So when we at AFT think about um, solar development, you know, we really want to minimize the um, impact of solar energy development to our nationally significant agricultural land and steer development away from those lands. Um, but also recognize that action on climate change is needs to be aggressive and it needs to happen now. So balancing those goals, I think, is the, the name of the game going forward. Great, thanks, Samantha. Um, I'm gonna respond to one more question that came in and then there are a few that hopefully will be addressed in, in some degree in kind of the, the next few portions that we're going through. But I also wanna let folks know that we are, uh, we have the questions, anything we are able to follow up with verbally today, we'll make sure to follow up with you um, offline. But the, the one, one that I just wanted to comment on that came in was if kind of new planned residential and mixed use communities could actually help save significant farmland. So kind of looking at places where um, maybe an alternative to a golf course is a farm uh, built into a community in some way. And, um, you know, I, I think the one reflection I have on that, and, and I'll have Chris and Samantha chime in additionally if they'd, they'd like to have any thoughts, is that the low density residential piece that Farms Under Threat pulls out, I think is really interesting to look at as um, where there's kind of the fragmentation and impact on land in, the, in a way that's less visible, but also, um, and, and that could be a potential growing threat as it converts to urban. But I also think that the re research points to where there's opportunities where communities have really kind of invested in supporting local agriculture and supporting farms in a way. So though, you know, it it is indicating that there's there's that threat, um, having kind of some of those opportunities and ideas that are thinking about mixed use with with agriculture is, is certainly um, something that it can can be considered. So I don't know if Samantha or Chris wanted to add anything or if we wanted to move on to the, the next portion. Well, let me, this is Chris, let me just jump in right quickly on that because I think you make a couple of good points. So first, the low density residential development, um, that we understand that um, just because we have labeled something as low density residential does not mean that there is not agriculture that is happening because, um, and it may be that in some places, right, it can be very successful agriculture, particularly where you have smaller parcels and there is a, you know, a robust way of direct marketing. So we, we don't want to suggest that it is, that there's no agriculture happening in that. What we are suggesting with low density residential is that it makes farming more challenging in many places because of the um, both of them, primarily the management challenges that comes from farming around people. 
But as uh, what you said, Erica, about the value of being able to use some of that land and the value of some mixed use um, development where you can have robust, very small farms, you can have strong community farms, um, you can have agri-hoods, that there are there are opportunities in there for successful farming. So we're not we're not trying to say that um, there's no way within that low density development of of um, uh, that there's that there's not value for the remaining farmland. We're just saying that it makes it more challenging, and oftentimes it's resulting in development of that land completely. Yeah, and just one okay. final thing I'll add that many of us see across the state, and certainly Department of Ag and Market staff deal with all the time, is the tensions between non-farming non neighbors and farming landowners. And those are real, and those put pressure um, in those communities on um, on farmers, and then, and then pressures are felt by the non-farming landowners who are living in farming communities. That's the only thing that I would add, um, that, that that tension there is real and, and does impact this, this conversation too. Great, uh, thank you both. Um, we're gonna move along here. We'll have some more time to continue to submitting questions, but the next piece here is really looking at where do we go from here? And, and that's some of what we wanna talk about over the, the next uh, few moments we have together. Time is not on our side uh, in saving our farm and ranch land, but, and like farmland, it is a finite resource. And so really nationally, AFT just announced a really bold and big new goal of doubling the amount of permanently protected farmland by 2040. And that also includes reducing the rate of farmland conversion from 2,000 acres a day to 500 acres a day, but by, in that time frame. And so that's, a big goal that you know happens will be happening across the country, but New York will certainly play a role in that. And what happens here in New York is important to our local communities, um, to these national goals, and really ultimately has has global impacts as well. As many of you already know, we're also here to be a resource. Uh, around state policy development, but more so to engage all of you in what the call to actions are and kind of what the work is that many of you are already doing, um, but how we kind of think together on what we can do here in New York State. Um, our goal with the policy scorecard is to really help generate ideas and even you kind of saw from some of the comments where, where are we learning from other states and also learning from what we're doing here in order to really step up our game and addressing the loss of farmland. And right now we really do have an opportunity to capitalize on increased consumer awareness around food security, especially here in New York, and thinking about food system resiliency to make the case for added investments in farmland protection uh, to address the looming challenges of generational transfer of farmland as, as um, folks identified as kind of a, a key threat here in the, the years ahead, and to also be innovative in addressing what fragmentation and that low dens density residential farmland um, means and we'll be working on this together with with you and really hope to kind of use this as a powerful new to, tool to support this work. So this just outlines some of the things we're thinking about on a bigger scale um, across the country as well as in New York. But I'll actually turn over to Samantha to give you a little bit more insight of some of the commitments we're we're thinking about um, right here specifically in in our state. Yeah, thanks, Erica, and that's really well said. Um, and actually. Uh, Chris, if you can switch to the next slide, um, here's sort of our, this will be our list of commitments to you. Um, and, you know, at, at first, of course, continuing to work with you, with state and local government, with partners through the Alliance for New York Farmland and through our solar siting work and, um, and our farmland access work um, through Farmland for New Generation New York and in so many other ways. Um, to keep land and farming and keep farmers on the land. Um, we're also going to be, of course, using these findings and insights from other states to develop new policy insights and recommendations. Um, and we'll look for opportunities to work for those policies and, and for policies that support um, diversity and equity and land access in the future as well. And then, um, you know, Erica said it so well just now. It's, this is especially poignant in light of 
COVID-19 and some of the weaknesses we've seen highlighted by, you know, concentrated and globalized food supply chains, that supporting farmers locally is really important. So that work we are committed to continue. Um, also, you know, reducing barriers for institutions to buy more New York grown and raised foods. Uh, the New York State Office coordinates Farm to Institution New York State with so many wonderful partners. And, um, you know, we've been working um, particularly focused on farm to school in recent years, but there are so many opportunities to um, reduce the barriers for our institutions to buy and serve more healthy, fresh, and minimally processed locally grown New York food to the benefit of our farmers and then also um, to the benefit of eaters and those institutions who are disproportionately vulnerable populations in New York. Um, uh, I'll just highlight that recent research from AFT and our what was called our Growing Opportunities Report indicated that growth in farm to school efforts uh, would could result in over $150 million being spent by schools at New York farms. Um, that would increase the access to healthy local food for over 700,000 of our kids across the state who go to school and would also generate over $210 million in economic impact statewide. So these are really significant investments um, that, that schools can make to support our farmers. Looking at number four there, um, of course, this is also a really critical goal uh, now, before, in the future, to ensure that farmers are a part of climate policy and climate solutions. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for that from the siting of renewable energy um, and the generation of renewable energy for on-farm use to um, increasing soil health practices that you know improve carbon sequestration in the land. Um, and then in addition, I'll mention that AFT New York put out a report called Greener Fields in 2017 that uh, looked at NYSERDA data and found that 66 times fewer carbon or greenhouse gas emissions are emitted on average per acre of farmland than by an acre of developed land. So um, keeping our land in farming is a climate prospect as well. And then finally, um, the fifth the fifth number here, one that we've it's run through the this conversation already. Um, we really do want to mitigate the loss of New York's best farmland, the most productive, versatile, and resilient um, from our necessary and important solar energy development. And we want to make sure that we're continuing to meet growing food needs while balancing the urgency to reduce emissions to address climate change. And to speak specifically on it, I mentioned earlier the new um, large-scale renewable energy siting law that was passed at the state level in April. Um, we're going to be um, engaging with the governor's office, with agencies to talk about regulations. We're working with the farm community on that with so many of you that are on the webinar today. Um, and if you want more information on that, you can reach out to me directly. And in addition, uh, AFT is going to be launching a new um, traffic light approach to solar siting on farmland project. And th that will be informed by this report's spatial analysis and maps. Um, and will be a stakeholder engagement process where we'll work with all of you to categorize where are the red areas that we don't want to site on farmland? Where are the yellow areas where we want to site with caution and with mitigation? And then where are the green areas where we, we definitely want to see solar siting on farmland in particular? And we hope you'll join us for that work. And I will, you can, you can count on the fact that I'll be in touch about it soon. Great, thank you, um, Sam. Um, so now we have time for um, just a last couple of questions. Um, and then I do want to get to talk about these couple of resources. But um, I'm going to ask one question. I'm going to ask it and I'm going to answer it myself because um, it is a uh, uh, a way for me to shamely shamelessly plug a couple of um, AFT policy priorities. There's a question that says, besides tax abatement for keeping land in active um, farm use, what other, what other types of incentives might encourage more people to return land to agricultural use if they were if they are property owners but not farmers? 
Um, and this is something that AFT has thought a lot about, um, and we see um, opportunity in a couple of fronts. So some policy ideas that we have talked about um, are a, and we are not the only ones, and we are working with many partners um, uh, that have talked about beginning farmer tax credits as a way to encourage property owners to sell or lease um, farmland to uh, socially disadvantaged, veteran, um, young, beginning farmers. So this is an ongoing conversation about um, uh, tax credits that have been used successfully in places like Minnesota, Nebraska, Iowa. Um, so that's one idea. And another idea at the federal level that we have talked about is a capital gains exclusion on the sale of land, again, to qualify a subset of qualified farmers. So that we see that is that 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 our federal tax code is um, encouraging folks to keep their land until they die and then pass it to, on to their heirs, whether or not their heirs seek to farm. And that what we want to do is change that dynamic um, and encourage folks to sell land. And you need to do that by changing the tax um, incentive structure. And that's why um, we're keen on capital gains um, changes. Um, there was another question. Chris, there, yep. there was one question here that I'm seeing that I think is a good one for us to talk about um, with the last moments on this webinar. Right uh, so the question is um, from Karen Strong, given that these maps were created with remotely sensed data, how appropriate is it to use the PVR data to prioritize farmlands locally? Do you have suggestions for ground truthing? So I would say on that, that the PVR data is, which is based on a combination of a number of different data sets. And that was, um, that is probably, I think that that resolution is down to 10 meters. Um, I, I, I'm going to guess that there's a um, a report on it, but I think that can be used. I think that's pretty, um, it's a pretty fine resolution. It is at a more fine resolution than the low density residential development, again, because that is modeling. Um, that would require more ground truthing. What is the best way to do that is a very good question. And I think we would need to give that some thought and be back in touch. Yeah, and I'm um, noticing that there are a lot of other really great questions here. Um, and we'll be doing some, um, Chris, you could speak to this more, but there will be an FAQ created out of these webinars. And I'm also happy, and I'm sure Eric is happy to follow up with um, many of you to answer your questions if you want to be in touch with us. Yes, so that's what we can do. When we have the FAQ that comes, we might it may not come out for another week or two, but we are collecting all of the questions from these webinars. We will put them all into a FAQ and send that back around to everybody um, who uh, um, registered for the webinar. So let me, um, I'm afraid that we need to stop because we do have one last poll and I wanna talk about these two resources right here. The last poll, if we can launch it, simply um, asks, it's, it's to help us think about how AFT can, um, can serve to provide helpful information and technical support. So um, you, can, you can vote for more than one of these. And I should have said that if before, if you can't seem to vote, you need to uh, um, get out of the full screen mode if that's what you're in, because that might have been uh, inhibiting people's ability to vote. Um, so let's just take a few more minutes on this. And maybe while people are voting, I will start to talk about these resources. One, the one that you see on the left is the Farmland Information Center. This is a collaborative um, center that we run with NRCS. Um, it provides information not just for 
um, organizations and uh, public agencies, but as well as for landowners and farmers. So there is information that reigns, ranges from all kinds of statistics around the latest agricultural census to other um, federal things like the total survey that talks about generational transfer of land. In it, you can find state policies, you can find um, information about federal programs, and I would just encourage everybody to think of it as a resource because it is a very valuable resource. It is free, people answer the telephone, they answer emails, feel free to submit any questions that you have around agricultural land um, to the Farmland Information Center. Um, so let's pause for a minute and look at um, what the kind of support people um, would like to see, um, which at the top are land use planning. Again, not surprising, and it is something that we want to start doing additional programming around. And again, on the state and local policy tools. So. Let me say then that that is a perfect segue into the National Agricultural Land Network. This is, um, we have finally decided to formalize something that we have done for um, all of our time um, to be a resource for agricultural land um, protection practitioners and planners that care about retaining and protecting agricultural land. So it's not just about permanent protection, it's thinking about all of the types of ways through planning that we can save agricultural land. Um, this is a network that is free, that is open to uh, any entity that is engaged in planning or protection efforts, so land trust, public agencies, that's either state or county um, conservation districts, you name it. So if you would like more information or to be a member, you can go to that website. Um, you can be in touch with me. Um, we are in the process of developing programming. Um, we will be having um, programming around these policy tools and getting into a lot more specifics about what has worked and where and inviting um, uh, staff from states where there have been successes on with various policy tools to talk about their experience. So we will be sending information about those, that webinar series um, shortly. I hope everybody will join and I wanna say thank you for sticking with us for the hour. We hope it was helpful and I will turn it over to Erica for the very last word. Yes, I'll just echo the thanks that you shared, Chris. Uh, special thank you to Commissioner Ball for joining us today. Again, I know you're in the middle of a lot of things right now and just appreciate you taking the time to share some remarks and to, to, to be here with us and appreciate all the time that each of you committed today. And we're really excited to bring this research out and to use it and to use it alongside all of the partners um, across the state that are doing tremendous work and we want to align that work together. So um, thank you and thanks to Chris and Samantha for uh, leading today's webinar and to co-hosting and really putting putting some great work into that today. Um, and I, I will leave it there. And, and of course, the, we have a lot of people on the tech side that you didn't get to hear from today, but we have a great team behind the scenes that um, made sure that everything ran smoothly. So thanks to them as well. Yeah, thanks, thanks everyone. Be in touch if you have questions and we'll be in touch with you soon.